On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to discuss the case for allegory. This is our fourth program in the series. And on today's program, we're going to look at the book of Ruth. To me, Ruth is one of the most inspiring of all of the allegories in the Bible. Now, when I say allegory, I want you to understand that Ruth was not a fairy tale. There really was a Ruth. She is in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is the verbally inspired Word of God. And yet in it, as God gave us these stories of the Old Testament, He placed within them certain prophetic themes that we can see. And this is one of the magnificent stories. Gary Stream is here to discuss with me the book of Ruth. It's one of the most beautiful stories. Some say it's the absolutely the pinnacle of all short stories ever written, J.R. It's the finest example of brief and yet complete writing that we have in any language on the face of the earth. Uh, it's an allegory. That is, it deals with symbolic subjects that carry across time and space, deep subjects. It's also a beautiful story about real people who have real names and their names mean things. Before we uh, look at Ruth, I want to uh, read a one paragraph letter we got from a lady in Texas who's been watching our series on allegory. She says, Dear J.R. and Gary, uh, for the Lord's sake, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, whether you believe literally or allegorically. And you know, I want to assure this lady that we're not going to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We do believe in the divine, full inspiration of the Word of God. Every word is true, right? Yes, that's right. And when we talk about allegory, it's possible that some of you may think that we don't believe the Bible to be literal. We certainly do. What I hope to be able to get across to you, and we have spent four programs now to try to do this, is to help you to see that the Bible is more than just mere history. The Bible is there to give us the great plan of God. The God who told us where we came from and how to live while we're here also tells us where we're going in the future. Oh, yes. And so this Bible has not only the inspiration of the past and the present in it, but the inspiration of the future. We have heaven to gain and it's just ahead. Hmm. Ruth is to me one of the most beautiful pictures of Christianity that can be found in the pages of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The story goes that Elimelech moved off to Moab. He lost his inheritance. He, he and his family lived in Bethlehem. He lost his mm -hmm. inheritance. He had to leave town. And they went to Moab, spent 10 years there where Elimelech died, his two sons died. And all that was left was his widowed wife, Naomi, and their two daughters-in-law. And it, the book of Ruth starts, verse 1 of chapter 1. Now, it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, and I wanted to include this, J.R., because this sets the time mm -hmm. in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he, his wife, and his two sons time of the judges. This was a time of famine and as you know from the history of the judges they had repeated apostasy. That is it, the land was in decline. Now Bethlehem means house of bread and house of praise. In those days it was a famine. There was no bread in the house of bread. Right. No praise in the house of praise. Elimelech means, the name means my God is king and yet he couldn't hold on to his own inheritance. Right. He lost it all. Naomi means pleasant or happy. When she came back, she said, call me Mara, which means bitterness. Now, Gary, we can see in this a picture of Israel. Absolutely. Israel lost its land, its inheritance, 2,000 years ago. Well, if we go back to 721 B.C., there's the Assyrian captivity, then the Babylonian captivity in 606, and uh -huh. then they were under the um, governorship of the Greeks, and then the Syrians under Antiochus Epiphanes, and finally the Romans uh, when Pompey uh, took Jerusalem in 63 B.C. Uh -huh. So we can see this continual suffering of the Jewish people. And eventually, of course, A.D. 70 and A.D. 135, the Jews uh, lost their city, Jerusalem, and then they were scattered to the slave markets of the world to become the wandering Jew. And for the next 1,813 years, they were without a country. 
This is what we see down in Moab when Machlon and or when uh, Elimelech and Naomi and their two children, Machlon and Kilion, mm -hmm. were forced to go into Gentile territory. Right. The Jews have been among the Gentiles for 2,000 years. So this is a picture of diaspora. A man, his wife, and two sons going off into the land of the Gentiles. You can expand this symbolically to be the whole world in the diaspora. And therefore, this story is not merely a local story, but it is a global story. And that's what we mean by allegory. Symbolically, it's a story that will unfold over the centuries. Yes. Now, while in Gentile territory, we have the marriage of Machlon and Kilion. Mm -hmm. The name Machlon means sick, mm -hmm. and Kilion means pining. Mm -hmm. And so day after day throughout those years of exile, Naomi faced the sorrow and the hurting of the sick room. Perhaps Machlon was an invalid. And perhaps Kilion, his brother, continually bore an attitude of pining, never happy, um, never playful. Day after day, his heart was heavy with one problem after mm. another. And Machlon married Ruth. And while over in the land of Moab, Kilion married Orpah. And so they, they got themselves two wives in that land. Yeah. Now the name Ruth means beautiful companion. Mm -hmm. And the name Orpah means stiff neck. Wow. Where have I heard that term before? Now, isn't it amazing <laughs> that while in, in uh, diaspora, mm -hmm. the Jews dispersed among the nations of the world, two major religions have come out of its roots of Judaism. And one, Christianity, is a beautiful companion mm -hmm. to uh, uh, Israel, recognizing our roots. Yes. But there is another religion that has come out of uh, Judaism. That is the world of Islam, mm -hmm. the Muslim religion. And, you know, they are somewhat stiff-necked, adamant, hate the Jews. Death to Israel. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. And, and of course, the, the Moabite woman, Orpah, uh, might be symbolic of that aspect of religion. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when, they, uh, when the time came for Naomi to want to go back home after 10 years, which may be a prophecy in times, Gary, mm -hmm. it takes this, uh, there is a specified period of time here for the diaspora. Uh, she told her two daughters-in-law to go back home to their own people. And Orpah, the stiff-necked, did that. And um, I, can, I can see Islam in that picture. Mm -hmm. But then when she, when she tried to get Ruth to go back home and stay or marry some Moabite man, Ruth uh, said to her in uh, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. What a beautiful picture of loyalty. Mm. Ruth, uh, faithful, loyal, uh, and by the way, obedient and hardworking. She, in fact, if you would like a model of virtue, you can't find a better model of virtue in the entire Bible than Ruth. Uh, she embodies all of the virtues, and her steadfastness is rewarded. That is, she is a picture of faith and also of perseverance. You know, this to me is a type of Israel. Naomi, a type of Israel, tried to disassociate herself from her two daughters-in-law. Mm -hmm. And Israel would like to disassociate itself from Christianity and Islam. Mm. <laughs> yes, yes. But Christianity says, uh, we're, we're here to help. Uh, you know, your God is my God. Yeah. And, uh, we're friends of Israel. Yeah, I think that's important for us to note. And so the day came when uh, they went back home. And when they arrived... Um, they were welcomed by the people of Bethlehem, and uh, Naomi said, I'm bitter. Call me Mara. Mm -hmm. You know the Jewish people are bitter today. Yeah. After 2,000 years of exile, yeah. they and are a bitter people. There is a certain cynicism there. 
Uh, and yet out of that cynicism, we know because we've read the end of the book, out of that cynicism will come ultimate redemption, deliverance. Yes. Ruth was no ordinary person. She was the daughter of Aglon, the king of Moab. She was a princess. I think this speaks well of Christianity. We're somebody special. <laughs> I like that, yeah. don't you? I do too. I think it's, it's nice to know that we are desired. Uh, just as uh, Ruth was desired of the man who was to become her husband. The story of Ruth is the story of a Gentile bride who marries the kinsman redeemer. What a beautiful picture of Christianity, the Gentile bride of Christ, and he is the kinsman redeemer. In the pages of the Old Testament, in the days of the Levitical law, a kinsman redeemer could redeem three things. First, he could redeem the land. He could redeem a brother who had been sold into slavery by paying his debt. And he could redeem a widow and take her to wife and raise up seed after the deceased brother. The kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ, is fulfilling every one of those prophecies. Mm -hmm. They are prophecies in this Mosaic law. Fascinating, isn't it? The, and by the way, as the story uh, continues, uh, there's an, an interesting note in Deuteronomy that gives this story uh, momentum. It, it, we find it in Deuteronomy 24, 19, it says, When thou cuttest down uh, thine harvest in thy field and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it, it shall be for the stranger. Leave a little bit around the edges of your field. This was uh, uh, the law of Israel. This enabled uh, Ruth, when she came back to that land, to make a living, shall we say. She went out, took advantage of this law, uh, knowing that gleaning was legal. And she said to Naomi, I'm gonna go out and do some gleaning. Uh, and she said it in a very particular way. She said, uh, I shall glean uh, uh, ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. The word is grace. Mm -hmm. In other words, she didn't know. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it is. <laughs> Dispensation of grace, salvation by grace. Found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's amazing. And it's the harvest. Of course, yeah. you can speak volumes about the harvest. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, Ruth was willing to go out in the harvest field. So when you went to Bethlehem and looked for Ruth, you'd find her out in the harvest field. Mm -hmm. Beautiful picture of Christianity. Because Jesus said long ago, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they're white already to harvest. We, Christianity, for the last 2,000 years have been in the harvest field and uh, we have been gathering a harvest for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're coming down to the days when we're gleaning, uh, the, the, the last few kernels uh, mm -hmm. before the harvest is complete. And you know, uh, in this setting, we find Boaz coming into his field in Ruth 2, 4, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to his reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? He says, uh -huh. aha, there's a new young lady out here gleaning. Yes. And it's obvious. From caught his, his eye. He caught his eye. She was beautiful. Yeah. And uh, he told those young men to leave hens fulls on purpose in order to make her harvest greater and easier. You know, the Holy Spirit goes before us to prepare the harvest for us as you and I go soul winning. It is the Holy Spirit who prepares the heart of the unbeliever, makes our work easier and more profitable and our harvest greater. Work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, you know, we don't see Naomi out there in the harvest field. I think this is important because the Jewish people have not been soul winners. Uh, for the most part, they feel they're the chosen people and they don't want Gentiles coming in and taking over, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the synagogue does not welcome Gentiles uh, normally. Uh, and so I think Naomi here is a magnificent picture of Israel today. Over the past 2,000 years, you have not seen the Jews sending out uh, missionaries. Now, Boaz is a, a, a very interesting word in the Hebrew. It simply means strong or strong man. And when Boaz's eye uh, was, was captured by the beautiful Ruth, he, his first instinct was to protect her. He said to Ruth in, in uh, Ruth 2, 8, uh, 
hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. You stay here. You're going to become part of my protectorate. And you know, the next thing he did was to provide for her, made sure that she got plenty. So he's fulfilling uh, the role of the Lord. Yes, and when she came back that evening to see Naomi, Naomi got the idea. Mm -hmm. Aha, he likes you. He, he's, he's going to be our salvation. And so she sends, uh, Naomi sends Ruth to lay down at the feet of Boaz uh, at the end of the barley harvest. That night when Boaz is sleeping out at, by his threshing floor and Ruth comes and lays down at his feet. Gary, that happened on Pentecost night. Mm -hmm. The night of Pentecost. Fascinating. The night of Pentecost. And that is the most significant night in my opinion uh, for Christendom because that night, is, there's almost something beyond reality about that night. It's filled with us with spiritual qualities. Yes. Uh, the Jews to this day celebrate that night of Pentecost in a festival they call Decorating the Bride. Yes, isn't that amazing? It really is. <laughs> and the Book of Ruth is read every year in synagogues around the world on the Feast of Pentecost. And of course, Pentecost is the day the um, church was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Tongues like as a fire that's set up on each of them in Acts chapter 2. And so you can see Ruth here. By the way, Boaz and Ruth got married the next day on the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is, a, this is certainly a beautiful picture of Gentile Christianity and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, our kinsman redeemer. Our kinsman redeemer. And you know, the law of the kinsman redeemer is that the, that the kinsman redeemer must be related uh, to the redeemed. Mm -hmm. And that he must be able to pay the price of the redemption. He must be willing to redeem. And he must be free himself to do the redeeming. That is, he has to be possessed of all these qualities. It's a picture of our Lord. And that morning, after Ruth had laid at his feet all night, he gave her six measures of barley and sent her back to mm. Naomi. Mm. He said, go back home to Naomi, take these six measures of barley. You know, to me, Gary, that sounds like six days of work. Mm. You know, 6,000 years of work. And uh, it, to me, it says, this is, this is, your work is over. And no it, more you have to work. No prophetically, work. it could speak of the sixth millennia before the seventh millennium of rest. Yeah. That wonderful. It's a beautiful picture. <laughs> and so we have this uh, kinsman redeemer, Boaz, going up to the gate of Bethlehem, taking Ruth with him. They went up to the gate mm -hmm. to find the nearer kinsman. There was an unnamed nearer kinsman, believe it or not, who had the opportunity to... Uh, save Ruth and uh, to marry Ruth and to redeem the land of mm -hmm. Naomi and they had to approach that near kinsman and the near kinsman said no I can't marry Ruth. This sets yeah. up the opportunity then for Boaz to marry Ruth. Now this story has what all good stories have. It has an uh-oh in it. You know every good story has an uh-oh. Yeah. And, uh, and the uh-oh here is, uh-oh, uh, if, what if this near kinsman decides to marry her? You know, that'll just upset all the plans. Right. But, but it also has a turn that leads to a, they all lived happily ever after because this, uh, this kinsman said in Ruth 4, 6, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I mar mine own inheritance. Mm -hmm. He was of the tribe of Judah. Now, he didn't want to mar his inheritance because this girl was from Moab. That's right. And so, this kinsman redeemer uh, could not, this nearer kinsman redeemer could not redeem the beautiful Ruth. He would not want to mar his own inheritance. According to Deuteronomy 25, 8, the elders of the city are to be called together if a near kinsman would not redeem then he is to have his shoe taken off of his foot and the girl is to spit in his face. You know, and, is to spit in his face. and his house, according to Jewish law, is to become defamed forevermore after that. Mm -hmm. The house is to be called the house of, the, of him who had his shoe removed. Uh, yeah. This is a, a serious thing, a serious offense. 
I think this nearer kinsman uh, could be uh, in the in the uh, allegorical style of the story could be a picture of the Antichrist or Lucifer. And the Antichrist, of course, uh, does not want to redeem. And he's one of these days, if you pardon the pun, he's going to be defeated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the agony of defeat. And as a member of the Bride of Christ, I'm going to spit in his face. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported ministry sponsored by our many friends across America and in your area. For a free complimentary copy of the magazine, call our offices directly at 1-405-634-1234 or write to Prophecy in the News, P.O. Box 7000, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma 73153.